welcome Alec Chief Executive Officer, Lisa B. Nelson. Well, good afternoon and welcome to the final general session of the 2020 States and Nations Policy Summit. Thank you for joining us this week and I hope you enjoyed the amazing speakers and discussions on innovations across all issues. We've heard from the Laffer our governors, Abbott and Sununu, Homeland Security Acting Secretary Wolf, and great workshops on recycling innovation and civics education. It's truly been an amazing week, and I'm sad to see it coming to a close. But before we sign off today and take our ideas and solutions back to the states, we have an afternoon of amazing panels, workshops, speakers, and continued conversations. One way we were inspired to innovate in such an unprecedented time this year was in our workforce development and labor policy. Americans want and deserve an enjoyable, rewarding, financially secure career. And more skills in a state means more opportunities for its residents, businesses, and communities. Our next speaker has done an amazing job throughout the Trump administration to clearly define and bring freedom to worker declassifications, call on state governments to act on occupational licensing reform, and to get politics out of state pensions. To address members on the Department of Labor's approach to the initial COVID-19 response. And today, he joins us on screen to discuss policies that build our workforce stronger and more resilient in times of crisis, like occupational licensing, independent contracting, and pension reform. I'd like to give a warm welcome to our virtual stage to U.S. Department of Labor Secretary Eugene Scalia. Lisa, thank you. It's great to join you again. You too. You too. We're happy to have you here. So we have a little side chat here, Mr. Secretary, and I don't know if you can tell, but I've got a little candle blazing. We we our office, uh, but we've got another program after this that's going to include some members of Congress incoming. Um, but to accommodate our our fireside chat, we wanted to talk a little bit about. Maybe what were your thoughts and perspectives on the recent election, and particularly from a policy perspective? Yeah, um, well, of course, it, it, we were told coming in that it was going to be a great uh, blue wave election, uh, Lisa. And what we saw was absolutely nothing of the kind. Um, we saw uh, in the House, for example, a really substantial pickup uh, by Republicans. I don't think the Republicans lost a seat they were defending in the House. We have a much narrower uh, Democratic uh, majority there. Uh, in the states, uh, we saw pickups. For example, you mentioned uh, uh, Governor Sununu, I think, uh, that we picked up. Uh, the Republicans picked up uh, uh, the uh, control of the legislature there. Uh, and uh, uh, Republicans picked up a governor's uh, seat as well. And um, but in some ways of greater interest, as you say, from a policy perspective, uh, there were a couple of initiatives that I was watching closely that I thought were you know, very interesting, very important. Uh, one uh, first was uh, in California. It was Proposition 22 with had to do with so-called AB5. AB5, as I'm sure uh, many folks know, is that California law which uh, really operated to reclassify virtually uh, all California independent contractors, or a great number of them, to reclassify them as employees. Very controversial. Controversial not just with California businesses, as you know, but with so many different workers who said that, uh, for one reason or another, they wanted the independence, the flexibility, uh, control over their hours or the like that, that comes with being an independent contractor. They, they, they said that's what we are and that's what we want to continue to be. Now, even before uh, uh, Proposition 22, California had been forced to make a whole lot of exceptions to AB5, I think more than 30 for different jobs, like uh, journalists, for example. Uh, but uh, uh, Proposition 22 was sponsored by some of these uh, the platform companies uh, who uh, wanted further exceptions from AB5 uh, in order to enable to, uh, this gig economy to continue to move forward. And that, uh, that proposition got substantial support, uh, resulting in an amendment further amendment to AB5, which in turn further uh, protects people who want to be uh, independent contractors. Now, uh, you know, very important to recognize, sometimes 
uh, independent contractor status is used to evade employment obligations, but many people uh, do like to be classified as independent contractors. Uh, there is an independence that comes with it, often a pride that comes with it, and Proposition 22 uh, recognized that. I think a lot of states uh, and I think a lot of members in the U.S. Congress had been looking to AB5 as potentially a model for progressive legislation. Uh, what happened with Proposition 22 is a strong message against that. And then, uh, secondly, another proposition that was watched closely in California had to do with non-discrimination requirements. Uh, as you know, some years ago, California outlawed uh, preferences in uh, state programs uh, that were based on uh, race or gender in order to uh, ensure a, a level playing field in which uh, people were not discriminated for or against on account of uh, race. And there was a strong move to repeal that. Uh, I think there was uh, an expectation on the part of many that California would repeal it. But uh, there was substantial support at the end of the day not to. I think about 56 percent of California voters uh, were in favor of that basic principle of non-discrimination. We want equal opportunity. We want people from uh, disadvantaged backgrounds, people who've been historically discriminated in the workplace to have opportunities, but we don't want, uh, California voters said, we don't want uh, disc more discrimination in order to get past uh, discrimination. So it was really, a, you know, obviously uh, every uh, nat nationwide election is important, interesting. Uh, there, of course, continues to be discussion about the uh, presidential level, but it was hardly the blue lay wave that had been predicted. I think there's a lot in the election that shows the wisdom of the, the policies this president had been pursuing. Yeah, you know, it's so interesting that Prop uh, 209 and that racial preferences issue, I worked on that probably 20 years ago with Ward Connerly uh, back in California. Right. And it was interesting to see that come full circle. And uh, you're right, again, California voted to say, let's look for skills-based and competency-based people for these jobs and not base anything on racial preferences. So I thought that was fascinating. Um, and then on the gig economy, you know, we, we at ALEC, and I know you have worked tirelessly to encourage entrepreneurship and innovation in all these jobs. So to see that um, independent contractor uh, work be recognized and for people to be able to maybe have two or three jobs that they want to piece together um, to, to create a career for themselves is going to work out. So I was really pleased uh, to see that. And I think you're right. The, the blue wave, uh, the political wave, ended up being kind of a, a red firewall of policies for innovation, entrepreneurship, and, and really you know, deregulatory. Um, and in that sense, um, the Trump administration and your department in particular, Mr. Secretary, have done such extensive deregulatory work the last four years. Can you talk a little more broadly about why deregulation is so important and maybe touch a little bit on how that's impacted the occupational licensing issue over the last few years? Sure. Um, you know, let me say, first of all, Lisa, that uh, I've been following uh, regulatory policy since the Reagan administration. I had the good fortune actually to uh, serve in that uh, administration in a junior role. Um, but I've followed regulatory policy closely since. And uh, this president has done more to promote uh, the elimination of unnecessary regulatory burdens than any president, including uh, even Ronald Reagan, who uh, made such a great contribution by furthering cost-benefit analysis, but this president has built really importantly on that in a variety of ways. And you know wh why is that important? Well, you know, first, just um, it, uh, it it promotes liberty. Uh, it restrains uh, government intervention from places where it's not needed. But second, that leads to exceptional economic growth. And there's so much evidence of that that has uh, been accumulated accumulated over. Uh, the years of this administration. Uh, Pre-COVID, we had employment at a nearly 50-year uh, low. We're, we were creating uh, often hundreds of thousands of jobs a month. You know, before the president was elected back in the summer of 2016, projections were that we would add under 2 million jobs during the first three years of what proved to be the Trump administration. But uh, instead of 2 million, we added 7 million jobs to the economy. And I, I strongly believe that part of that 
was the deregulatory philosophy, which unleashed so much more economic growth, job creation, than we had seen under the a prior administration. And we also know that workers benefited greatly from that. There were some really interesting reports coming out from the Fed, uh, coming out from the Commerce Department a couple of months ago. Uh, looking back over the last few years, uh, they show uh, one thing, that 2019, we saw the largest increase ever in uh, 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 net wealth uh, uh, for uh, American households. And second, the uh, largest decrease on record in the poverty rate. So 2019 was an extraordinary year when it came to uh, pay for workers. We saw that lower wage workers actually had a, a greater growth in pay. And then we saw a Fed study which showed that the wage gap narrowed uh, during uh, this administration, that uh, income of uh, lower income households went up more than 30% over a three to four year period. And people at the highest income brackets actually saw just a slight de decrease in net worth. So these deregulatory policies, I think also the president's tax policies were very good for workers and also uh, very good for uh, lower income workers and other uh, workers who've been disadvantaged in the workplace uh, particularly. So those are some of the fruits of deregulation. Obviously we're seeing some really great stuff going on at the state level. We've seen uh, Idaho, uh, Oklahoma, uh, adopt their own uh, deregulatory uh, reduction initiatives, uh, Arizona, Ohio, many other states, uh, patterned after some of the things the president has done. And then, as you mentioned, there's this, been this strong drive against occupational licensing. Uh, one of the really terrific things about the economy the president built was there was such a demand for workers. I think it increased the pressure against unjustified regulatory hurdles. And one of those was uh, high occupational licensing requirements. So we've seen a number of states, and I know uh, many of the people participating in this uh, conference this week that uh, took steps to recognize occupational licenses issued by other states or to ease the ability of military spouses to take the occupational license they'd obtained in one state and, and bring it to another. So these are all things that have helped lead to the great economic growth that we experienced pre-COVID, uh, but they're also things that have led to just greater freedom and, and wage increases. And just one last point I wanna make on this, Lisa, um, obviously uh, COVID uh, uh, sideswiped that economy that we had. It, it presents an ongoing challenge that we have to be very attentive to, but we are coming back much more quickly economically than we did uh, from the great recession. I believe that is in part because of the strong economy the president built uh, pre-COVID. And I think it's also because of uh, the sustained emphasis on policies that do promote growth. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the fundamentals were so strong that even with a crisis like COVID-19, you know, the strength of the economy and that one-two punch of tax, tax reform and cutting the red tape just contributed to making it so easy to kind of bounce back. And I'm really, really proud of, of what this country has done. There's another topic that I wanna make sure we cover since I know your agency has done significant work in the retirement benefits space. This summer, Alex submitted a comment to the Department of Labor, DOL, in support of a regulation regarding fiduciary duties in a private pensions under the ERISA. The final rule clarifies that plan managers must select investments solely based on financial considerations, not a manager's own goals or preferences. We seem to be talking a lot about preferences, uh, which could, it could include the environmental, social, and governance, those ESG factors, without a fiduciary impact on investment choice. Can you explain what the new rules in this space do and how that's going to play itself out in the next few years? Sure. Um, yes, uh, Lisa, this is one of a number of uh, rules we've been working on uh, in uh, the ERISA space, which, of course, is the federal law that uh, governs the um, administration of uh, private pension plans in this country. It, as you know, doesn't apply to state pension plans. Frankly, those plans present some very serious problems of their own. Uh, there may be room to, for state plans to uh, learn lessons from uh, ERISA, but uh, our rule is focused on uh, private pension plans. Uh, now, so-called uh, ESG investing, investing, that's 
investing that's focused on uh, the environment, social issues, or governance of corporations, ESG investing has been a, a very powerful uh, uh, trend uh, in the uh, investment community for a, a number of years. It's perceived by many, um, particularly uh, many uh, progressive groups, as a way to advance uh, policy goals that are important to them uh, concerning the environment uh, or, or certain social issues. And uh, it, w when we conducted this rulemaking, we had some people who were very explicit about their belief that the trillions of dollars that are in private pension plans ought to be marshaled in order to further their views about uh, the, the uh, uh, carbon emissions, for example, uh, to uh, encourage divestment from uh, the fossil fuel industry and that sort of thing. Uh, our rule is simple. Our rule says that there actually is a really important uh, social objective that's to be served by our private retirement plans. And that's funding retirement. Uh, that is the objective uh, to uh, invest and marshal plan assets in the way best calculated to generate retirement income for American working men and women when they've uh, left the workforce. And our rule is clear that uh, when uh, people in charge of pension plans, instead of just trying to fund retirement, try to use other people's retirement money to further political or social goals, uh, that's a misuse of those funds and it's a breach of their fiduciary responsibility. So our hope is that this rule will uh, make uh, uh, planned fiduciaries, that's uh, people responsible for uh, retirees' retirement assets, uh, 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 more focused on just the investment returns uh, that they get uh, from those assets and, and, and that they uh, be careful not to try to use them to further other goals. Now, we also recognize, of course, that uh, sometimes an environmentally uh, hazardous uh, investment is a poor investment. Uh, you want to be careful about buying a super fund site. So we get it that at times these environmental factors particularly uh, can be legitimate investment factors, but the goal needs to be uh, protecting American workers' retirement security, and our rule aims to make that clear. Yeah, you know, that is so important. It's just a check on kind of what are the motives around these investments? What are the motives around who you're going to hire? What are the motives around who you're going to put on your board of directors? Um, and, you know, whether or not there's a personal or political agenda attached to that, it's so important. In our final few minutes, Mr. Secretary, could you give some advice to the state legislators who are um, listening to this conversation around what they should be thinking about with respect to their, their pension plans and their uh, legislation and policy that they're going to be starting in January? Well, you know, that, that could be a much longer discussion, Lisa, right? Um, but uh, yeah, a couple thoughts on that. Um, you know, to start, um, this point I've just been making about just recognizing what an incredibly important social value uh, it is just to have secure retirements for people. And that really needs to be the overarching and really sole objective of uh, state pension plans too. Uh, federal law uh, requires that. And that's why um, when we took a look at some of the things going on with ESG, we felt it was important uh, that we in administering ERISA uh, make that clear. Uh, I think uh, state uh, legislators uh, should uh, not hesitate to advocate that same view. There, there have, have been state plans, CalPERS in California is a good example, that have divested, for example, from tobacco. We've seen divestments from fossil fuels or, or guns uh, where uh, the people responsible for folks' retirement have wanted to make a political statement and have divested from uh, profitable companies uh, and actually have uh, cost uh, state retirees. So I think there needs to be discipline around that uh, in the states, and that is something that could be a proper subject of uh, uh, legislative action. Uh, more broadly, we know that there are problems uh, with uh, underfunding in, uh, in a number of states when it comes to their pension plans. And I would urge again that folks take a look at uh, some of the standards that apply under ERISA and, and ask why similar cautions aren't appropriate. Uh, under, under state pension plans as well. There are fairly strict uh, funding requirements that apply to private pension plans uh, under ERISA, but which are not observed by state pension plans. And I think that is part of the reason we see 
uh, some state pension plans that are are underfunded and and could 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 become into serious trouble. So I think those funding requirements, these very uh, I think important uh, notions of fiduciary responsibility, uh, need a careful look. And and of course, uh, scrutiny is uh, warranted too to uh, circumstances uh, where uh, collective bargaining regarding uh, uh, pension benefits uh, may be resulting in plans that are uh, simply too rich uh, for the assets that are held uh, by those plans, which with, with potentially adverse consequences for either the people that are in those plans or, or even for the taxpayers. I think that the collective bargaining of those benefits uh, can present some challenges that uh, states need to take a careful look at. Yeah, it's so important. Well, thank you so much. It has been such a pleasure having you today and at our last meeting. Uh, we will look forward to working with you in the future. And thank you for your advice and counsel. And have a happy holiday. Well, you too, Lisa. Thank you for what you do. And again, thank you for what Alec does. It's really uh, been a pleasure to join you again. Uh, as I mentioned before, Alec is a an organization I've known, I guess, since that first job I had in government uh, back in the Reagan administration. And um, really grateful for the important work your members do to promote some of these ideas uh, throughout the states. Have a great weekend. Thank you so much. You too.